So uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, Bitcoin blockchain statistics and hash rate statistics. So um, I actually, I, I have a blog site which is hashingit.com. Um, I apologize in advance for anybody who looks at it. It's a terrible website from a layout perspective. But you know, hopefully the content's interesting. Um, and obviously I work for Pinover as well. Um, so who am I? Because uh, I don't think anybody here apart from the guys from Pinover really know me at all. Um, I've been around <coughs> doing systems and software architecture for 20 something years. Uh, I'm actually based out in the UK. Um, I have done everything from 8-bit microcontroller-based systems all the way through to mainframes, standalone systems to you know very, very large distributed systems, distributed control systems. And uh, if anybody goes looking around on Google, you might find me on a few other things that I've done as well. So I've developed operating systems, network stacks, worked on compilers, and I've done a whole load of things with open source Go back to like 1992 for Linux. Uh, there was an OS called VSTA. I did 10 plus years of working on GCC, uh, so a lot of compiler stuff there. And uh, I had a project called Licorice, which then spun off into something that ended up with me coming and working here intermittently. So I uh, come back and forth to the Bay Area quite a lot. So uh, my Bitcoin history is actually very short. Um, I got introduced to this as a whole concept like six months ago. So uh, Gangesh, uh, where Gangesh is in the middle there. Uh, Gangesh and I have worked together uh, for quite some number of years, and uh, he just uh, started doing high Bitcoin. And he uh, called me up one day when I was here and said, "You know, you should come and look at this Bitcoin stuff." So I did and said, uh, "I'm not sure about that," and then started thinking about it. So I thought, "Well, this is interesting." So I started the Hashing It blog, which was really just a bit of a brain dump of me trying to understand how this actually worked and how the statistics worked and how the economics of everything worked and sort of I went from being very, very sceptical early on to actually, you know, joining PIN over as the VP of Software Architecture, you know, four or five months later. So uh, I've, I've been the VP of Software Architecture for the last couple of months, or just under a couple of months. So uh, where am I? Uh, I'm normally in North Wales in the UK. Most people don't know where that is, so I'll show you in a second. Uh, I'm frequently found in San Jose, uh, and all too frequently found in airports or on planes. Uh, I spend a lot of time backwards and forwards, so I'm here about three months of the year um, in the UK, the, the remaining time. So uh, I always explain to people how you find Wales, you go to England and turn left, because they're not the same place. Uh, my wife isn't here, she's Welsh, she, she would uh, appreciate that. And um, the best thing about Wales, in some respects, is that it has a national flag that really should be an open source emblem. It's a really cool flag. Unfortunately, it doesn't appear in the Union Jack, but you know, it's, it's a sore point in Wales. So uh, in, in Wales, we have this history of mining. So we have uh, slate mines, copper mines, and um, coal mines, so we know quite a bit about mining. Um, but unfortunately, we have modern Welsh mines. They turn the slate mines into a trampoline place. And uh, my son seems to think the only thing involving mining is, is Minecraft, so. <laughs> so anyway, I'm going to talk about uh, hash rate statistics. And so when I, I started thinking about this, I thought, well, you know, am I actually going to be able to talk for an hour about hash rate statistics? Um, I actually don't know, because I've not had a chance to run the presentation. There are an awful lot of slides, though, and so you know, we'll, we'll see how we're going for time. Uh, I'm not going to talk too much about protocol design. I do have a lot of background of having done network protocols. I've designed entire operating systems and network stacks from the ground up. So this is something I care about a lot. And in my previous existence, I had 12 years of designing network-oriented systems. So I have a lot of interest in the protocol aspect of it, but I'm going to sort of steer away from it for this, this, this part of the presentation. So um, why, why should we care about hash rate statistics? It, it seems like a, a fairly abstract thing to talk about. Um, it, it turns out that not many people do talk about the statistics. A lot of people speculate, but very few people actually get into the statistics of um, how hash rate statistics are calculated, why they work a particular way, and what they mean. So, why should we care? Well, the first thing is to understand a Bitcoin network, or, or other cryptocurrency networks. They're essentially using the same mechanisms. Um, how do they really work? What, what can you really infer what's useful and what's not useful? Um, one of the biggest problems, especially if you start looking around on various forums, is people have a lot of theories about what the statistics indicate. And there's a lot of statistics that are published related to um, hash rates and, and blockchain statistics. But actually a lot of them aren't very useful. 
and, and in some cases they're outright misleading. So I want to talk a little bit about some of those and why they can actually cause confusion. Um, one of the really important things from my perspective is to, to use the statistics to understand if the, the network is behaving the way we expect it to behave. Bitcoin is designed to behave in a decentralized manner and we're expecting it to behave in a particular way and with everybody participating in a particular way. But there are some known attacks against the network and are there anything, about, one of the things I wanted to know is are there things we can understand from the statistics that would actually indicate if the network is not behaving the way we expect because some participant in that network is actually not behaving the way we'd like them to. Um, and the other thing is I, I wanted to actually try and predict how things might change in the future. Um, so I was very interested in, in the network expansion and how the network was growing and what was driving that and were there things in the statistics that, that could actually be inferred from that. So, hash rate estimation. Hash rates are estimated, they're not measured. Um, and that, I, mean, I think probably most people involved in development understand that. But in practice, a lot of people want them to be measured. It turns out that's very difficult to do. There's no mechanism to actually um, to, to disseminate that hash rate measurement. It's so, so you end up with all of the statistics are largely inferred. And I'm going to talk a, a little bit later on about why that's not necessarily as accurate as people might like it to be. Um, essentially, the statistics form, come from one of two forms. They're either a measurement of a certain number of hashes and how long they take to, to complete, uh, you know, a certain number of blocks being found. Or you take a fixed amount of time and say how many blocks were found in that fixed amount of time. It's a pretty crude measurement. Um, in fact, it's a very crude measurement. So, measured hash rates. If you look at uh, some, some measurements, and here's a, a, a sort of a graph that's pretty commonly shown, this is from Bitcoin Wisdom. Um, it's very, very common that you see the sort of nine month or sometimes it's short to two or three months sort of hash rate measurement. And the first thing that's striking to most people who've seen them for the first time is, you know, all the numbers to the right hand side, uh, all, all, the, all the graph to the right hand side looks like it's horrendous and going out of control by comparison with the earlier, earlier phases. The biggest problem, of course, is this is a linear graph, and we're dealing with something that doesn't really fit well on a linear graph. Um, the other thing is, I mean, this particular one, this, is, this was one from this morning. Um, if you actually look at it, you can see sort of some fairly erratic behavior. There's a very large difficulty spike there right in the middle of what was actually a fairly gentle uh, period of difficulty changes. Um, and, and that tends to get people very excited about what's happening and why, and, and trying to understand whether there's something happening in the network that shouldn't be happening or whether there's some unexpected change starting to occur. Um, you're looking at the same thing again, this time the same data uh, over a slightly different time period, but this one's from blockchain, and, uh, but this is daily hash rate estimates. And if you actually look at the daily hash rate estimate, you can see significantly more volatility. I mean, the, the, the volatility is, is quite dramatic. Um, again, the same, I've got the arrow pointing at the previous one, if you look at that, uh, the blue curve is actually over a, a, a more prolonged period of time, so the waiting is, is longer. Um, if you look at the same thing, and that's the same event there on the daily hash rates, it's less obvious because there's a lot more volatility on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, one of the things that had a lot of people get very excited uh, on some of the forums a week or two back was an apparent 50 peter hash per second um, spike in the hash rate that occurred over the course of a couple of days. Um, that spike's pretty large and it looks, at the first glance, like a fairly significant event. And so people tend to uh, try and assume that there's, there's something strange happening. Is, it, is, it, uh, is that just because it's like a, a relative spike? It is a relative spike and in fact that's one of the things I'm going to talk about. Um, the, the, the presumption is that you shouldn't be able to see that sort of size of swing. And from a very, very large number of uh, people tend to assume that you shouldn't see that sort of swing. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about why. In fact, that's not actually the largest swing we could have expected to see. Um, statistically, we could see much larger ones. So if we saw it in the first half, we, would, we wouldn't see the same spikes? You would see exactly the same spikes, in fact. Um, what would happen, in, and, and this again is another problem, is that people tend to only focus on the very recent past. They don't tend to look at what's happening previously. Um, and again, it's a linear graph. So what are the strange spikes? Um, there's lots of people ha like to theorize about what the spikes are. Um, you know, there's large amounts of new hash rate coming from somewhere. And some of these will occasionally be true. I mean, somebody will turn on a new, new data center from time to time. Um, 
there may be some, some hash rate that is actually previously being used for something else and now gets switched onto the network. But in practice, um, it's much more likely they're just statistical anomalies. In fact, not even necessarily anomalies, they, they're quite, quite likely to occur. So uh, the economic sanity check, I, I like to have people think about this one. The economic sanity check is to ask what would it actually cost to affect the network in the way that people would like to think perhaps it's been, being affected. If you take some fairly good state-of-the-art numbers, the amount of money that would be involved to actually cause this to happen by actually trying to make it happen is pretty staggering. You'd need to spend at least $20 million in hardware. You'd need to build some significant warehouse capacity. You'd need a lot of cooling. You'd need a lot of power, uh, power capacity. And you'd need an awful lot of operational expense to, to run that. So the first sanity check really is to say, does this actually make any sense economically? Would, would it be possible that somebody's done this? So um, the, the, the obvious question is, can these really be statistical noise? What are, what are the statistics that you would find in terms of hash rates? So the very first thing we can do is switch away from linear plots to logarithmic plots. It turns out logarithmic plots are the only ones that make any sense in this sort of, this sort of uh, system. The linear plots exaggerate everything to the right and minimize everything to the left. So if we take the same linear plot that we saw before, but this time we switch it to a logarithmic plot. What you actually see is that the volatility is pretty much uniform all the way across the whole plot. So the question about if you looked at things earlier in the, in the, um, earlier in the timeline, would they look the same as the ones on the right? The answer is yes, they do. Um, it's just simply a, a question of scale. The relative sizes of everything are very, very similar. And that 50 peter hash spike actually looks surprisingly uninteresting now. It's, it's really not significant at all. Um, there was a similar one about uh, four or five months ago that was uh, around about eight peter hashes. Uh, and again, it's just a relative, um, relative scale. So the other thing that's interesting, of course, about a logarithmic plot is that if you actually plot a straight line on a logarithmic plot, you can actually see if you are seeing exponential expansion. There was a period of time where that was almost a straight line. Um, in fact, if you look at the statistics from the end of last year and the early part of this year, it was pretty much a straight line, and we were seeing um, a, a straight logarithmic expansion. But now, in fact, that's slowing down. So, in fact, there is actually a slowdown in the hash rate, and, and that's likely to continue until there is a significant change in the technology that's implementing the hashing. So we've reached the limit pretty much in terms of process technology for ASICs. Um, there are a couple of nodes left. I've not talked about that in this, but there's some stuff on the blog. Um, we're in 28 nanometers now. There's some room to go with 28 nanometer, but it's not a huge amount. Uh, the reality is we can get to state of the art at around 14 to 16 nanometers, and then we are just waiting on the fabs to be able to, to move to something better than that. So the amount that we can actually gain from just <coughs> process technology is diminishing significantly. The other problem is that from a power efficiency perspective, um, the power efficiency just isn't improving at the sort of rate it was before. When you could jump and, and leverage many years worth of process improvements in you know, the course of one generation of ASICs and go from 130 to 65 to 28, then you could see, see dramatic improvements and, and dramatic improvements in the power efficiency. That's just not possible when you start getting down to 28. So yes, you could put more capacity online, but the amount of power it's likely to take is going to go up much more dramatically than, um, th than we were seeing in previous generations. So this is leading to a slowdown. Um, the other thing, of course, is you can look at the, uh, the block mining reward and say, well, most of the funding for this uh, sort of hash rate expansion has to come from the block mining rewards. And given that there isn't a massive spike in Bitcoin price, which is driving up the ability to pay for more hardware, then you're not going to see those sorts of huge increases. There certainly is the capacity to do that. I mean, if the price of Bitcoin was to go up by a factor of five, then there's a lot more money available for people to throw at hardware and throw at operational costs. So there is scope for that. Uh, but while things are actually relatively static, then things are going to slow down. Uh, so we'll, we'll see some slowdown. Uh, in fact, if you look at the hash rate growth, uh, again, this is a, another fairly standard chart. This one's showing the daily hash rate um, growth, and it's, it's tailing off this year. So we were at a peak at about 3% per day, which is a phenomenal increase in any sort of computational network. We're now somewhere around about 0.75, 0.8% per day. Uh, it only just recently went below 1% per day. 
but it's still a phenomenal growth rate for any sort of computational network, um, but it's significantly lower than it was earlier in the year. So uh, again, linear plots, uh, just showing the futility of them. The all-time linear hash rate, uh, hash rate shown on a linear scale is really spectacularly uninteresting. Um, and if we actually look at it on a logarithmic plot, it's actually much more informative. You can actually see some of the interesting trends on the plot. So you can actually see uh, there's, there's a sort of steady growth as people were sort of becoming interested. You can see the point at which it plateaued when people were on GPUs. Um, and then you can see where the FPGAs and ASICs started to kick in uh, around the middle of last year and, and the growth that's coming from that. So you can sort of predict from that where it may go. Um, that curve's tailing off somewhat. Um, obviously, there is some, some room for that to change based on, on the Bitcoin price, but it's, it's clearly not going to be going to sort of the exahash level just anytime soon. Um, there's there's going to be some slowdown. So, um, how can we characterize mining? What, what actually drives the statistics behind mining? So, um, mining is essentially a Poisson process. Um, it's not quite that simple, but I'll get to that in a minute. But if you look at um, the, the statistics associated with finding any individual block, then you can look at it as a, as a simple Poisson process. And um, basically, the Poisson process gives you a probability of finding a, a, of an event occurring. Uh, in this case, an event would be finding um, a block. The, the hashing st is set up in such a way that uh, we don't actually gain anything useful by having mined anything previously. Uh, there's nothing useful that can be inferred about the SHA-256 hash. So essentially we have something that's a, a Poisson process, rather like a radioactive decay. Um, the time constant is actually nominally set to be 10 minutes, 600 seconds. And so we should see, on average, one block every uh, 600 seconds. Now, in practice, of course, we actually see far more than that. The reason being that the hash rate isn't actually uniform, and I'll talk a little bit about why there's a bias there a little bit later on. But nominally, it's set up to be 600 seconds. And if we had a network in which there was no hash rate expansion over some period of time, then you would average that 600 seconds. Um, if you actually look at what that means in terms of um, the statistics over the course of an hour, uh, one of, this, this is where the statistics start to become sort of rather interesting. It's, I'm not sure how clear it is, but there's actually a reasonably good probability um, that, and I think it's a, it would occur about once every four days, that you will not find any blocks in an hour um, over that nominal period. There's equally well a statistically good probability that you will find 12 or 13 blocks in an hour. Um, it's going to give you an average of six, um, that, that's what we should see. But in practice, you can actually go for significant periods of time, and there's nothing actually wrong with that. It will statistically occur. There was an instance um, a few weeks ago where there was 75 minutes between uh, blocks being found. Uh, there was nothing actually wrong with the network at all. It's just something that will statistically happen about once every month, just over once every month. Um, and so this actually it does present some interesting challenges. Uh, it presents some challenges in terms of uh, getting transactions confirmed. Um, but it also, I mean, it, it, it's just a natural characteristic of the way that mining is actually set up. So uh, on, the, on the chart, the yellow is actually showing the probability of the particular block, um, numbers of blocks being found in the R, and the pink is actually showing the cumulative um, probability that you will have found, uh, you found X number of blocks before that point. So the implication is that you, you would ideally like to have something that was happening more frequently. Ten minutes per event is actually quite coarse. Um, and it, it leads to a lot of the volatility that we saw in the early parts of the hash rate. Um, as I mentioned, one of the things that you get is you get uh, block confirmations happening quite quickly sometimes. But you can also see them happen, taking a very, very long time. So uh, another, another graph which is showing the same sort of thing, if you take a nominal 14-day period, given that the 2016 blocks is supposed to be found nominally over 14 days, if you actually take a nominal 14-day period and you look at the probability of finding a particular number of blocks in 14 days, and of course this assumes that things are reset, um, so if you assume this was a zero difficult change, then you actually find there's quite a wide spectrum. And there's actually a pretty high likelihood 
that you will either find significantly fewer or significantly larger numbers of blocks in that same 14-day period. So even though people tend to think about a difficulty change as being something that should be fairly fixed, that in fact there's about a 4% difference, plus or minus 4%, uh, when you're talking about um, events happening once every, every five difficulty changes. So um, again, that, that I, I can certainly share these with anybody who wants to see the, the graphs. Most of these are actually off, off the website. There are a few others like, that aren't. Um, so in practice, though, uh, Bitcoin mining is actually not quite a simple Poisson process. It's actually a non-homogeneous Poisson process, uh, sometimes referred to as an inhomogeneous Poisson process. And by this, what, it, what we mean is that the lambda time constant actually just change over time. So. It's a slightly unusual process. It doesn't quite follow any normal natural process because there's a reset that occurs every 2016 events. Um, and so we reset it to try and actually um, move it back to being more like the homogeneous uh, process. But um, what it means is that as hardware is being added and, and subtracted from the network, and at the moment it's predominantly being added to the network, that time constant is actually getting shorter. So the time constant at the beginning of a, of a series of 2016 blocks and at the end is significantly different. Um, and so it makes it a little bit more difficult. Um, it does change the statistics, um, and, and I'll show some of the bias in a second. So uh, simulations, this is a sort of quick interlude. Um, a lot of the stuff I've done, because there's no easy way to analyze it uh, as a straight mathematical um, analysis, I actually built simulations um, to actually model most of this stuff. Um, the simulations were done as, as custom software for, for the Hashing It website. Um, it was the only way I could actually generate the data I actually wanted. Um, there's actually a number of ones that I haven't yet published. So there's, there's a couple of simulations that I've, I've done to try certain things out, which I haven't had time to publish because I've been a bit busy the last two months. Um, they're all written in C, simply because I wanted them to run as fast as I could possibly get them to run. Uh, mainly because to get really good data, some of them need about 10 million runs so simulating 10 million mining operations over 15 or 30 difficulty changes. Um, and some of those runs take 12 hours per simulation. So when I produce some of those graphs that uh, have five or six traces on them, that's actually 60, 70 hours of run time to get the data. Um, what I am doing is I'm going to open source all of those tools. So pin over half um, some repos that we, we have for some of our own code. I'm going to set up another one, and uh, we're going to publish all of these as GPL2 code. So if anybody wants to pull those, re those um, simulations down and use them for whatever purpose, then please feel free. Uh, I'm going to publish the links on the, on the website. Uh, I dare say Prakash will publish some pointers to them as well. Uh, and they'll be hosted up on GitHub under a GPL v2. So um, getting to the first of the things that are actually done based on the simulations as opposed to just straight analysis, because everything up to this point has just been simple analysis. Um, this is the, one of the first simulations I did, which was actually looking at what are the probabilities to find 2016 blocks? How long will it take to find 2016 blocks, given certain behaviours in the network? And so the, uh, the curve on the, on the right, the yellow curve, is actually showing a, a, a network where there's no change in the hardware, there's no expansion in the hash rate occurring. And so you'll see in the middle that 14 days is the nominal uh, block finding period. But you'll also see that there's actually a reasonable amount of, of that um, curve which is actually nearer 13 days or nearer 15 days. And those are in fact going to be normal statistical variances for finding 2016 blocks in a network that's not expanding. As soon as you actually start to have the network expanding, those, those curves shift to the left. So the red curve is actually showing what happens when the network's expanding at 1% per day. The green shirt curve is showing a more extreme one, which is with the network expanding at 2% per day. So that's more typical of what we were seeing perhaps three, four months ago. Uh, what you also see, of course, is some overlap. So even though the network may be expanding at 1% a day, or it might be expanding at 2% per day, there's a statistical chance, and it's a reasonably good statistical chance, that we'll see exactly the same observed hash rate. And yet there's a significantly different hash rate in terms of actual hardware capacity over, that, over the period of time. So how much randomness is, is there? <clears throat> so I, one of the th things I wanted to understand is what would happen and, and how much randomness is there in, in the, the raw statistical data. So that my approach to this was to 
try and work out how much noise there would be in a network that was not expanding at all. So there's exactly the same hardware, it's online all the time, there's nothing changing in the actual underlying uh, computational network. So uh, this is a high noise area, it's a surprisingly high noise area, and one of my challenges, but I'm guessing there's a few people may have seen some of these statistics, one of my challenges to people in the past has been to ask them the question, if you were to take a network and, and you had a Bitcoin network running for six months and nobody was adding any capacity or taking any capacity away, what would happen to the difficulty? And the vast majority of people tend to assume the difficulty would be pretty much static and, and nothing would actually happen within the network. Well, it turns out that that's not actually what would happen. Um, the difficulties change quite a lot. So this was a single simulation run of two years. So this is two years worth of difficulty changes. Um, and so this is finding 2016 blocks for each one of these changes, for each one of these spikes. What you actually see is that on this particular run, um, you actually get anything up to a 5% difficulty change. In fact, you, you can actually see more than 5%. This was just one, the first one I happened to do. You can get anything up to a 5% plus or minus difficulty change, even though the network isn't changing at all just simply because of the way the statistics are generated. What this means is that when you're actually looking at hash rate statistics and you see a difficulty change of 10%, you don't actually know whether that 10% is a real 10% or whether it could actually really be the network move 5% or maybe it was 15%. There's no easy way of telling. The only way you can tell is over time. After enough times elapsed, you can look back at history and say, well, that was probably 8% because you can see the trends over time but you have no way of inferring anything useful on that single event, or even probably for a couple of events afterwards, until you can see a sustained trend. You can make some predictions, but it's... I have a question. Sure. It might, it's, it's a basic question, it might even be a silly question, but why do you have to run a simulation in order to calculate this? Why can't you just estimate it from first principles? You could try to. Um, and in fact, for the, for the, from the case of, of this one, you, you could certainly do that. Uh, in the case of a network that's not expanding at all, it would be very, very simple. I just happened to be lazy and did it as a simulation because I, my longer-term goal was to actually try and see what the simulations would look like if you did this with a network that was expanding. And you have that inhomogeneous process and it becomes more tricky to do it analytically. Um, yet certainly you can actually generate these statistics very easily um, because it's a simple Poisson distribution at this point. Um, simulations again, this time there's three of them overlaid on top of each other. Um, you can actually see, in fact, in some cases we have some spikes that are actually tend toward 9%. So uh, in, in the course of this is effectively six years worth of mining, and it was the first three runs I did, uh, you, you actually do have several events where there's greater than a 5% difficulty change occurring just because of statistical variation. So uh, again, th th this makes it very tricky to actually make sense out of statistics where you see a, a difficulty change of perhaps 10%. It's, it's actually very difficult to tell whether that 10% is actually just pure noise or whether there's actually something interesting happening until you have a lot more uh, long-term data. So, so are you saying that all that variation in terms of passion power is, is uh, changed as <coughs> is random? All of it is random? A huge amount of it is random. It's, it's, it's a surprisingly large amount. So uh, in fact, uh, we're going to talk about exactly that. So noise and practice. Um, I actually wanted to try and see if my models, because I was quite shocked by my models when I, when I first simulated them, I wanted to see how that actually worked in practice. Now, of course, we only have one relatively small amount of data to work with. We have the current blockchain. I could actually try the same thing on some other altcoin blockchains. I haven't had time to do that. Um, but I wanted to see what would happen if I applied that to the last 12 months' worth of uh, Bitcoin uh, blockchain statistics. And so uh, what I actually did was I took the... Um, statistics, and this, this one's actually just to make the graph easier to read, this is only six months worth of data. But I wanted to show a couple of things that were sort of interesting. The first one is just how much the difficulty actually lags the real hash rate. So as the network's expanding, the difficulty is going to lag the hash rate by about seven days. I mean, if you look at how the difficulty is calculated, that makes sense. The difficulty is trying to rewrite the previous 2016 blocks worth of history and say, if we had um, the average amount of hashing that we had for that previous number of blocks, what would we need to set the difficulty level to? And so it's always going to lag a little bit when the network's expanding. 
If the network was not expanding at all, the difficulty would match to a, a first approximation. It would match the actual measured hash rate over time. It would average to zero. Uh, but in practice, it lags by about seven days, which is a quick way I'd found to estimate that, which worked remarkably well, was to take the previous difficulty, take the square root of that, and multiply that by the current instantaneous hash rate as a, as a gauge for what the actual current estimated hash rate would be. So in fact, you'll see that plotted there um, as the sort of greenish line going through the middle of the, uh, the actual measured stats. And you'll see that's actually slightly ahead of the, the difficulty. So if you actually take that average and you subtract it from the measured numbers, and you actually look at what's happening, you can actually see in the middle there is zero, and the rest of it is the deviation around that. That deviation, if you actually run that as an analysis, is almost exactly a normal distribution. Um, in fact, there is the, the, the distribution. <coughs> and given that this is actually just a single random sample for 12 months, that's actually a surprisingly good normal distribution. Um, there seems to be very little wrong with it. The, the interesting things with this are, though, if you actually look at it, the outliers here, there is uh, a minus 23% on one day, and there's one that's, I think, a plus 28%. So on the day-to-day -day statistics, there's some pretty large swings in any one given year. Um, if you actually start looking at it for finding events that occur 10% you know, of the time, plus and minus 20% and, and events are actually surprisingly common. So um, it's sort of bad news for daily stats. So I, one of the things I actually learned from this, I used to fixate on watching the stats <laughs> two or three times a day because it was interesting. Uh, what I've realized is it's a really, really bad idea. You can't <laughs> learn anything useful from them. Um, it's, I still do it. I, I can't help myself. I, 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 just, I, I, I want to stop doing it, but it, it's just too interesting. But uh, it's a really bad idea. In practice, um, anything less than about two weeks' worth of stats is probably just noise. But it's still fun to look at. It. Um, the good news is, though, from the, the statistics over the last 12 months, is the network looks pretty much like it's doing what we expected to. Nobody seems to be doing anything untoward. And in fact, this is one of the reasons why I think the statistics are really interesting, because if we can actually generate um, statistics that are constantly being analyzed, we should start, start to see if things look statistically anomalous. And that would be a good thing for, um, for everybody. So um, I'm going to talk about everybody's favorite story from the last month or two, mining pools. So um, back when I was much younger than I am now. I used to play a game called Jet Set Willy and, and Manic Miner. So meet Miner Willy. Um, Miner Willy has 0.01% uh, of the global hash rate. So as it stands today, he's got about 16 terahashes. The interesting thing is not the number of terahashes, it's the percentage of the network. So uh, my hypothetical miner has 0.01% you know, of the network, and he can do anything he wants with it at all. So the question is, what? would a rational miner do? And um, he wants to understand how best to maximize his returns over a six month period. And I, I, I'm assuming it's a 1% increase in the network every day, which is you know, approximately true from a, a, a month or so back. So 1% um, per day. Here are the statistics associated with a network that's expanding at 1% per day. Um, when it's expanding 1% per day, a difficulty change will occur about every 12.3 days, 12.4 days. Um, so it's, it's a bit quicker than the 14 days. In fact, this also has an interesting impact on the date for the next block halving, because uh, most people tend to assume that the block halving is going to occur roughly four years from the previous one. But as the network expands, that date is getting closer. And in fact, the interesting thing is, if it expands, if the network should expand in big steps, that date will actually get closer relatively slowly. But if the network expands very, very steadily at the same rate, it actually gets closer quicker. Because the difficulty can't the difficulty changes will absorb large steps very quickly. But they won't absorb small steps very quickly. And so you'll actually see if we had that sort of expansion rate, every 2016 blocks, instead of taking 14 days to get closer to the difficulty to the, the, the block reward halving it's actually taking 1.6 days less with every single one of those, those um, changes. If you actually look at the statistics, um, the difficulty change is typically going to be 13.1%, which is very simple exponential. 
And it just so happens that um, there's exactly 15 difficulty changes in 183 days, which is what our miner is looking for with this six months. So at the end of the period, the hardware that we had at the beginning is now hashing at effectively 6.177 times less of the network than it was at the start. That has a big impact, obviously, in terms of thinking about return on investments. As the hash rates de um, the rate is, is decreasing, uh, the, the, the rate of expansion is decreasing, then obviously that number reduces. Um, and it makes it possible to think about things over a much longer period of time and think about return on investment over a longer period of time. But in this particular case, we'd set a threshold of 15 difficulty changes or six months. So, um, the first thing we might want to do is we might want to be uh, quite purist about this. We might think, you know, we've got quite a large amount of hashing. Uh, what happens if we go solo mine? So we just take our hash rate and we mine it as a solo miner. Um, the answer is that these are the, uh, the probabilities of what you'll get as a reward in terms of bitcoins over that six month period. That's quite a wide spectrum. Uh, I don't know if everybody can see it, but the far left is zero bitcoins and the far right is 100. Um, there's actually a reasonably good chance, it's something like about 4.9%, that our miner doesn't actually get a single bitcoin if he solo mines. There's also a small chance, um, and I think it's around about 1% or so, that they get 100 bitcoins based on the current uh, block reward. The nominal is actually around about 32, 33-ish. Um, but that's quite a wide spectrum. And you could be anywhere on that spectrum. You could be basically anywhere on that, on that green line. Um, and it's a pretty wide spectrum for 95% you know, to 5% confidence levels. Um, that's quite a large spectrum. So um, decentralized solar mining, not such a great idea. Yeah, in this example, we're using something that has point. 0.1% of the network? Of the entire network. What percentile of, of miner would he be in in terms of his hashing power? Uh, in terms of, it's actually very difficult to tell. Um, they would be pretty high. I mean, you're talking about having 16 tera hashes, which is not something you'd be running at home. I mean, there's just no so way. You're, 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 you're talking about a small scale commercial miner at this point. Um, I mean, realistically, even with state of the art power, that 16 tera hashes is going to be, um, I guess, 14, 15 kilowatts, even if they've got absolute state of the art. So it's not something you're going to be doing at home. This is, you've got some facility you're running in. So um, why pool? Well, the, the answer is the statistics make it pretty compelling to, to actually do some amount of pooling. Um, you have 2016 blocks to be found. A solo miner is just not going to find them. That's, that's the problem, is that uh, they have one ten thousand for the network, but there aren't 10,000 blocks to be found in any difficulty change. So in fact, they're on, on average only finding 0.2 blocks per difficulty change. And there is a problem in that while the network is expanding, there is no good time to not be mining. You want your hash rate online immediately, as soon as you possibly do it, because it will never be more effective than it is right now unless the network suddenly loses a large amount of hashing capacity, which just hasn't been happening. So um, pooling, the simple reason to go pooling is that it reduces your variance. Um, if you want to actually think about this as an investment as opposed to just a pure gamble, then you need to, to look at some way of actually aggregating your hashing with somebody else's in such a way that you will see a significantly better or more deterministic return. So if we go back to our solo mining, model, but this time we now compare it with a very simple pooling model where the same miner finds nine other miners who have got the same amount of hashing and they merge and they mine as a pool. What happens? Well, that's what actually happens. 10% um, of a small pool, same amount of hashing, and you get a dramatically better um, and more deterministic payout. You don't have the probability, or you don't have the same probability that you get zero. There is actually a tiny finite possibility you get zero. You don't have the same possibility you could get huge rewards, but you actually end up with a better average reward, and you've got a much, much higher probability that you're going to get a reasonable reward. And so this is the problem with mine, uh, with, with, with pools. It makes sense to be part of a pool. In fact, um, if you actually want to take this to an extreme, here's actually what happens if you look at the mining for various different sizes of pool. 
So the, uh, the orange curve going through the middle is our solo miner. The green curve is actually the one I just showed you for the small pool. As you move sort of closer to the middle and to the right, um, that's what happens when you move all the way through to a pool that is running with 50% of the total hash rate. And so as you join a pool which is larger, the determinism of the payouts you're getting is better. And in fact, if you're actually looking at this from purely from a commercial perspective, there's a significant incentive to being part of a large pool because the, the determinism of the payout is better. So what you're looking at is the, the way that the mining is set up right now is there's an incentive there for people to be part of large pools. So much as everybody doesn't want them to be, the reality is that anybody who is going to pay for mining equipment and actually expect to get anything back from it is going to go towards those large pools Shh, right now. Don't tell it Reddit. Don't tell it Reddit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they don't like it on Reddit. <laughs> what about expected return? Well, the expected return is actually much more even. If you actually look at the statistics, what you're actually looking at is the cumulative um, returns. And so, um, if, if you actually look at these, they're actually set up so that um, if you have, probably easier to come to it here. If you actually look here, a mining pool that's got 50% of the hash rate, it almost certainly never results in, in our miner getting more than about 35.2 bitcoins. But equally well, he's almost never going to get less than 34. Uh, I can't see the exact number. It's about 34.2. So the range is very, very narrow um, in, in terms of what you can expect. The problem is that even as part of a pool that's 10%, that's now actually gone up several percentage points in terms of the range. So now at a pool that's actually 10% rather than um, 50%, you're actually talking about the 5% uh, line being somewhere in about 32 and a half. So there's a significant variance there, even even for the difference between 10 percent size pool and the 50 percent size pool. Yeah, this this is a total newbie question because I'm just not in the mining space at all. Mm -hmm. What do the larger pools charge the, the same? The all pools ch charge the same? Uh, no, all pools do things in all sorts of weird and wonderful ways, and, and they're not very transparent about what they do. Mm -hmm. um, so the the reality is that this is only talking about statistics of what happens if you actually group everybody together, and in terms of what will happen at the pool operator level. What the actual individual pools pay out is, is a question for the pools themselves. So you're, you're, you're assuming a, a uh, transaction fee less pool pretty much for these calculations? The, these are assuming that, that, the calcula that, that, this is, that there's no fees being taken from the pool. This is just to actually look at the statistical variance. Um, in practice, you, if you had a pool that had a very large pool fee, um, then you may actually find that you get more reward as an individual miner with a slightly smaller pool that has a better fee structure. But this is just simply what the statistics are for having that fraction of the network capacity. My understanding is that a, that a large pool has an economy of scale advantage where they could, I don't know if they are in practice doing this, but they could theoretically charge lower fees and, and still make more money. Yes, and, and large pools have some other advantages as well. There's some second order effects which I've not really touched on here. Uh, but it's something I plan to look at in, uh, sometime later this year. A large pool has the ability to have a much larger network infrastructure. So they can afford uh, larger fat pipes, so they can get their blocks to other places quicker. They can propagate them faster. They could certainly, you can certainly imagine, one of the things that actually when you, when you look at block confirmations is you look at the signature verification and you look at um, the, the actual processing of, of the transactions. A larger pool is going to be able to put more infrastructure in place to do that quicker. And so they have some inherent advantages. It doesn't give them a huge advantage, but it does start to give them some small advantages. Um, there's also advantages for people who are doing centralised mining in that they don't have to contend with the speed of light for getting data around the same way. At, at the moment it's a relatively small impact, but there, there is certainly an impact there. Um, so there are lots of advantages for, doing, for, for actually participating in a pool. And in theory, there's also um, problems for people because pool operators can actually prioritise certain transactions and they can prioritise certain behaviour in a way that would actually be very difficult to spot just purely from the statistics. Or you could do it in such a way that the statistics would be questionable. Uh, you could imagine situations in which you don't propagate blocks to potential competitors, but you've propagated them internally with your own network and are already working on them much quicker. It's not a full block withholding attack in that you're not actually with, withholding the block from everybody else, because that would be pretty obvious. Uh, but it's certainly giving you a slight advantage. And when you're talking about large pools, then that slight advantage starts to add up. <coughs> so, in fact, that's sort of the subject of the next piece, which is 51% attacks. <laughs>
A single entity controlling 50% of the hash rate can, in theory, rewrite blockchain history. Um, in practice, you need more than that to actually rewrite blockchain history reliably. Um, an entity that's doing block withholding actually only needs a third of the network, they need 33.3%, assuming nobody else is doing the same thing. Um, there's actually some, some pretty good papers that talk about why those, those things happen. The interesting thing about block withholding is that that would actually show up pretty quickly in the blockchain stats. Could you, you explain would... block withholding a little bit? Sorry? Could you explain block withholding? Oh, okay, right. So, so the principle of block withholding is that rather when you actually find a block as a, as a pool or a large miner, rather than actually propagating that out to the network that you've actually found a block, you actually hold on to it. And you start working on that on the next problem based on the block you've just found. And the idea is that if somebody else finds a block, which is actually now matching the previous block, you can broadcast your old block straight away and say, you know, here we go, here's another one, and there becomes an orphan race. But in theory, you've had some amount of time between when you actually found the block and when you actually released the block, where you've been working on the second chain. You may have found the next block. You may have found the next couple of blocks. So that would allow you to actually build a longer chain. And all of the work that the rest of the network has been doing while it's been finding the shorter chain is no longer useful. They've just created a long orphan chain potentially. So the idea of a block withholding attack is that you can actually use your um, network capacity and you can leverage that in such a way that you put everybody else at a disadvantage. Now, block withholding would show up in the statistics because what you'd actually see is you'd see a, a significantly increased rate of orphans. So you'd see two blocks being released together very, very frequently, um, and that isn't happening right now. But this is something that statistically would be something to watch. Uh, it would... Sorry. Go on. <laughs> this is the same as the selfish mining problem, is the block withholding, is that the same? Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> so I mean, it, would, it would actually show up in the statistics. Right now, there's no real evidence that that's happening. So I've noticed, um, I guess I don't know if this happens in mainnet, but in testnet, the times of the blocks are all not sequential. Mm -hmm. I mean, by a lot. But oh, like yeah. Minutes or half hour. The, 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 Is they, that they, from block withholding or is that something else? No, that's just the fact that timestamps don't seem to be very well synchronized. Um, it oh, happens okay. frequently. Um, if you actually watch the um, stats on something like blockchain.info or blocker.io, and you actually watch them, you'll frequently see um, several minutes where things appear to go backwards. Uh, and you'll see blocks. I mean, it's actually most, most noticeable at the end of an hour where you'll see that you suddenly appear to go backwards in a few minutes and then jump forwards again. In fact, sometimes you can go backwards and have two or three blocks that are actually pre on the previous hour and then jumps forwards again. And it's just simply, there's a, there's a lot of slack in the protocol in terms of what it will accept as a block, um, block timestamp. So um, one of the things I was actually interested to understand was... Um, what were the statistics associated with declaring somebody has 50% of the network? Because we've already seen that it's difficult enough to judge what the network's capacity is at the best of times. How would we actually know that somebody has 50% of the network? And this, this was a question I posed because uh, everybody's getting very excited about uh, ghash.io apparently crossing the 50% threshold. And I was curious as to whether that actually meant anything. Um, Again, we can't say for certain because you don't know where they were, but statistically speaking, it seems unlikely they ever actually crossed 50% of the network um, in, in real terms. They had more than 50% of the blocks for a relatively short period of time. But in practice, um, if you look at the statistics, you're actually looking at around you know, the, the 10th percentile and the 90th percentile, and this is a simulation for somebody who actually genuinely has 50% of the network capacity. Uh, the 10th percentile is there at about 44.4, 4, 44.5% as the, as the measured hash rate. And the 90th percentile, they're at just over 55, they're about 55.4. Um, so that would be the range that you would expect to see as the measured hash rate for that particular entity that has 50% of the hash rate. So in practice, seeing a, a short period of time, and this is measured over 24 hours, Seeing somebody holding 53% for 12 hours probably isn't very interesting. If they were holding it for a sustained period of time, that would become much more interesting. But just holding it for a short period of time doesn't really work. Um, what's also interesting is, uh, unfortunately this doesn't show very well, uh, but 
hopefully everybody can see the slides later. Um, this is actually doing the same thing. This is looking at the same miner with 50% of the actual hash rate, but looking at a period of 2016 blocks and what's the actual measured percentage that they see over that period of time. This is obviously a much longer, percentage, uh, longer period of time. This is more like um, uh, 14 days as a nominal um, period of time. And again, the 10th percentile, they're actually at about 48.5%. So even over the period of 14 days, they may only appear to have 48.5%, but over the same period, they may appear to have close to 51.5%, 50, uh, just simply because the statistics happen to work that way. So um, this leads on to one thing, uh, sort of one thing. I, I wasn't sure whether to put this in or not. So based on the statistics, if I could change one thing in the network, what would I change? So the one thing I would actually want to change would be something that would actually make the statistics easier to work with and actually a little bit more, um, a little bit more deterministic. And um, it occurred to me it's actually very similar to one of the problems right now, which is we have a block confirmation time which is normally 10 minutes. Um, the problem with that is it does actually mean that there's a reasonably large chance that we don't actually have any blocks found at all in the period of an hour. So the 10 minutes seems a little arbitrary. Uh, I can sort of see where it would come from. Certainly when you're bootstrapping the network and you have a lot of people on relatively slow network connections with relatively erratic peer-to-peer -peer connections, um, and relatively slow computers actually working on the problems, then 10 minutes is probably a pretty safe bet. But unfortunately, it has a few downsides. It limits transaction volume. Um, either that or you have to increase the size of the blocks. And increasing the size of the blocks has its own set of problems. Um, and unfortunately, as we've just seen, it, it incentivizes large mining pools because there's so few blocks actually found in a difficulty change that it actually is a positive asset to be part of a large pool in order to get the minimum variance. Um, so the thing I would actually do would be to reduce the block finding time. But I'd do it in... A, what would it take to do that? Uh, it would take a hard fork. So it, it would have to be agreed and it would have to be a hard fork in the protocol. Or um, a new coin. Or a new coin. It could be a new coin. Um, Yes and no. I mean, you, you would actually end up needing to do more confirmations. Uh, but the, the good news is that you would have, a, you, you, from a statistics perspective, you'd be more likely to verify that number of, of confirmations quicker. So I'll talk a, bit, a little about that in a second. Um, what I would actually do is I would actually go to changing the confirmation time about 5x, not in one step. I, I, I would probably plan to do that over a period of time. So this is my wish list feature. Um, I do it over a period of time. You might even take it to 10x. I'm not sure whether 10x would actually work yet. I think there's a point in time where 10x would actually work. Um, certainly as network connections get faster and uh, signature checking can become accelerated, then you could certainly make this faster. Um, you would certainly need to have the statistical guards in place to verify that um, various people involved in the mining network were actually propagating blocks systematically and, and propagating them correctly. Um, but that's actually relatively straightforward to do. Um, but what I'd also do is I would re reduce the block reward proportionate to the speed up. So if you actually increase the rate of block finding by a factor of five, you reduce the reward per block by a factor of five. That way you end up with the same number of coins being created at the, same, uh, at the rate they are now. So you don't actually do anything in terms of devaluing Bitcoin, you don't actually issue any more coins, you simply issue the coins in smaller amounts, but issue them slightly more quickly. Um, so that has a couple of interesting things. It turns out that doing this one thing actually has the same effect as changing the pool ratios. It's exactly the same statistics. Um, and that's one of the simulations that I'll actually publish later this week. Um, if you actually look at this, this is actually just three curves. This is actually, in fact, you could take exactly the same curves but actually apply them with um, mining pools of different sizes. If you actually increase the uh, block finding rate by a factor of five, you actually move to the right-hand side. So you actually move to uh, this curve here, away from this curve here, which is the original one that we have right now. If you actually look at what happens if you have a smaller mining pool that has less of the hash rate, you actually find it actually pushes things in towards the center much more aggressively. So you actually have disincentivized 
some of the reasons for going for larger mining pools. There's not the same economic imperative because you've actually made the payouts much more systematic and much more consistent. <coughs> the, uh, in fact, I've just said that, that you end up with 5x the finding rate. It's the equivalent of actually making the pool five times larger. Um, you do have a small increase in the orphan rates. Uh, that's not actually so much of a problem though, because the orphan rates, them, the, the orphan races themselves don't become so much of a problem, because the losses associated with losing an orphan race are, are less. Instead of losing 25 bitcoins, if you lose an orphan race, you now only lose five. So yes, there are more orphan races, they will certainly occur. Um, it'll actually be slightly higher than it is right now. It's a small increase um, in, in terms of the number that you'll see. It won't be 5x, it'll be a little higher than that. Um, but the actual cost of them is much lower. But the impact in terms of the behavior of the whole network is substantially improved. You actually have disincentivized one of the, the things that's causing everybody the most consternation. But it's also the one thing that from an economic perspective, <coughs> as a rational miner, you want to be part of a large pool. But if you can get the same payout by being part of a smaller pool, then there's not the same incentive to actually go ahead and, and be part of that, that <coughs> larger pool and have to put your trust in a pool operator to do all the things you want to do. So that was it really. Uh, I have put my contact info in there, so I have a fairly boring set of email addresses, davidhashingit.com, davidpianova.com. There are other ones, most of them are Dave, that's something. Um, you will occasionally find me on Bitcoin Talk when I have time as Dave JH. And for those of you who like going to uh, Flame Wars, then I'm on Redis as well from time to time as well. Um, and thank you very much. Any questions? <laughs>
Um, it would be an interesting area of research. I mean, part of the problem I had when I was doing this is I was actually working on doing SOC design for Qualcomm. <laughs> so I was sort of busy doing other things. And then for the last two months, I've been busy working on Pianova's software architecture. Um, but um, So hopefully I'll get some more time to look at this. But obviously, this sort, to, to me, this sort of statistical data is actually invaluable because we can actually start to look at how these networks behave, how the cryptocurrency networks behave, and actually understand more about what we can do with them. We can actually start to design changes in them more intelligently. It seems that too many of the altcoins have made slightly whimsical choices about things without any real thought as to what was going on. And, and there is no question there's some underlying brilliance in some of the original design choices for Bitcoin, some of which probably weren't documented. Um, I mean, it, it seems unlikely that some of the, the characteristics would have just been chosen completely arbitrarily. Um, but it, it's a bit like uh, working in a, in a big company versus a startup. In a big company, everybody tends to write everything down because it's the only way to under, understand what's going on. In a startup, nobody writes anything down because you can keep the whole idea in your head. And it's sort of the same thing when you're talking about something that's a brand new design. So I suspect there's a lot of unwritten things that never got documented. Um, so you're new to the neighborhood in uh -huh. February, and you're bringing in a historical you know, background that's you know, pretty heavy weight. How do you see things evolving over the next you know, two or three years? Uh, in terms of uh, Bitcoin, um, I think we're certainly going to see uh, some fairly large shifts in the way that the hardware is produced. Um, I think that's already happening. Uh, I mean, one of the reasons I'm with Pin Over is because we have some fairly heavy hitting in terms of the VLSI side of things. I mean, I've worked with a lot of these guys for some, some time over the years. Um, I think you're going to see that happening. I think um, there are some interesting challenges in terms of the decentralization thing. I think there is definitely an interesting set of challenges in terms of protocol evolution. Uh, one of my concerns right now is that we have a protocol, and it's, it's fairly typical of most network protocols, they tend to be somewhat volatile early on and they become more conservative in terms of development over time. Um, I'm not sure that's necessarily the answer we need right now. I think that, that there is some scope there to actually make some other improvements, and I think those will be necessary. Um, in terms of the actual network and securing the network, I think that there will be some expansion. It's certainly going to slow down. I'm not aware of anybody yet having found a magic solution that allows you to do these sorts of cryptographic operations dramatically quicker. Um, certainly that's, that's possible. Somebody could have a, a, a quantum computing breakthrough that would, would make this much, much easier to solve and, and then we could see a, a huge change. But in the short term I think that there's going to be a big emphasis in terms of trying to find solutions to some of the power issues and in, in terms of um, how you can enable um, hashing more efficiently. Um, and I think, I mean, and, and from what I'm seeing right now, there's an enormous expansion in terms of people thinking about what they can leverage this network to do. So the thing that to me was the most interesting aspect of this whole thing, and the statistics were sort of interesting because I was trying to understand how this worked and what, what you could do with it, but the whole blockchain technology to me is going to open up a whole new spectrum of, um, of, of databasing type of class of applications. Um, typically every five to ten years somebody comes up with something new and radical that allows you to go and solve a whole class of problems that haven't been solved before. And I see this actually doing the same thing. I think that there will be that whole class of open ledger um, problems that can be solved with the same sort of technology. Some of them can be solved with Bitcoin. Some of them might be solved with something else. Some of them might require a completely new evolution that's independent or perhaps bootstrapped on top of. Um, but I think there's, a, there's an enormous amount of um, opportunity to, to do new and interesting applications in this space. Cool. Oh. Have you engaged any of the Bitcoin devs, core devs, on some of the ideas and some of the conclusions you've uh, come to? So, so the answer is no, not yet. <laughs> um, so actually I have been slightly remiss. So, so normally I sit and lurk on mailing lists all the time and I haven't really had time. So I only actually joined the Bitcoin devs one about three days ago. And it was remarkably silent for the first two days. <laughs> yeah. It sort of exploded today. But yes, I mean, it's, it's an area we want to talk about. I mean, I think there's, there's some really interesting things that can be done. I'm curious about the behavior of the um, uh, hash rate and difficulty feedback loop. Mm -hmm. And um, 
I mean, it's a feedback loop that's got delayed it. You don't yeah. expect there be some conditions under which it might misbehave or oscillate and such. Yes. Well, I mean, there's certainly oscillation. Um, it's, it, I, I haven't seen anything that gets into like a forced oscillation. Um, maybe I haven't found the right simulations yet. Um, in fact, that's actually an interesting. It would be easy enough to try with the simulations and actually see if there are any circumstances where you get real outlying behavior. I suspect there probably are. Um, I know just occasionally when I look at random outputs from some of the simulations, some of them give some fairly wild answers. Um, so there's obviously been a sequence of very, very improbable things happen back to back. Um, I can't. Actually, I'm interested um, not so much in a, you know, a random stimulus, mm -hmm. but in a forced stimulus. You know, oh. Somebody wanting to cause something to happen. Well, the, the interesting thing is how you would go about doing it, and, and part of the problem what is, the data yeah, you, you, you'd, you'd have to be talking about something that was at a pretty statistically large impact to the network. Mm -hmm. um, unplugging a data center would certainly have an impact. Um, the interesting thing is you have to unplug it for probably a reasonably large period of time. And, and even a single data center these days is not going to have enough of the hash rate, I suspect, to make any dramatic difference to the, to the difficulty. Um, if the network wasn't expanding, then that might actually be a much more interesting time. Because then, then you can have a much larger impact on, on, the, on the behavior of the system. So yes, that would be an interesting thing to look into. Is the loop sensitive if it's not expanding, if it's constant? Is it sensitive like at, at steps or something where the difficulty rate might go up and down? Or is it? I don't know how. Yeah, it if, if 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 there's, if there's no if there's no change in the hash rate, the difficulty does go up and down just as a natural function. Um, but yes, I mean you you could potentially. I mean I haven't really thought about it, but certainly if you saw the observed hash rate going down, then potentially you could actually unplug capacity and make it drop even further. Um, I'm not sure whether that would actually have any significant impact on the difficulty though without actually looking at it because what will happen is the rest of the network will eventually return itself back to a normal mode of operation um, and statistically speaking it would actually, it, because it oscillates up and down, it happens to have gone down, it's probably going to go back up again. Um, so it will just look like somebody took capacity offline. I'm not sure it really makes a huge amount of difference. Um, Certainly, I, I've seen some wild theories on some of the forums, because the forums are great for wild theories. Some wild theories about people taking hash rate offline in the last couple of days of a difficulty change to make a difference. It doesn't make any difference at all. The amount of impact that a single data center would make, even if it had 50% of the network capacity, uh, if you took it offline for two days, it's not going to have that much impact on the difficulty, <coughs> simply because it's not had enough time to make a, 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 a huge impact. It's only had one fourteenth of the network offline effectively for the period of time. Last question. Wow. Awesome. Awesome. Dude, <laughs>